Okay, I think we are live. I think so too. Yes, okay. So welcome everybody and hope you're having a great day wherever you are. Happy Friday <laughs> and welcome to the, the SEDS Canada National Student Space Conference. Um, this is called Ascension 2021 and we're here to help you build your future in space. So we're really happy that you are here with us, coming together from afar, and we would really love to virtually welcome you to our conference here at Hopin, the platform that we're using. Uh, but without further ado, um, I'd like to just acknowledge the land on which SEDS Canada's headquarters operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron, Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still a home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and be based on this land. Our mission here at SEDS Canada is to strengthen Canada's future in space by uniting students, not only undergraduate students, but also upper secondary and graduate students, and industry professionals. We are committed to providing students with unique projects and events, educational research programs, professional development opportunities, as well as networking opportunities. So SEDS is not just a national organization, it's actually an international initiative and we're happy to have SEDS USA and SEDS Sri Lanka here with us as well. So we are all students helping students and I'll pass it on to Arslan, our conference coordinator. Okay, thank you, Shamira, for the introduction. As mentioned, my name is Arslan, and I'm the coordinator for Ascension 2021. It's an honor to be on this platform speaking to all of you who represent the future of the Canadian space industry. Uh, while it's unfortunate that we can't all be in the same room right now, I'm sure that in the future, we'll all come together at some point as our paths interwine as we move through our uh, routes through, space -bound, <coughs> through our space-bound paths. For now, I'm just happy to give the first hello. Moving on to Ascension. This is an event that's been running since 2015. From humble beginnings, this conference has grown from a local university project to Canada's largest student space conference and Canada's national student space conference. Normally, we host this event in a different city every year for the sake of accessibility, but this year we'll be broadcasting to the whole world. With that said, our team has put together an exciting lineup of some of Canada's brightest and most inspiring academics and industry professionals. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this year's Ascension theme celebrates the diversity of people and professionals in space. We want to bring light to all the different paths that people have taken to pursue their passion for space, so as to put weight behind the message that if you have a passion for space, you have a place in space. During these next couple of days, you'll hear speakers talk about topics ranging from the effects of microgravity on human DNA to feasible methods for interstellar travel. Obviously, this range can't be condensed into five categories like we've labeled here in the slide, but for the sake of simplicity, we've tried anyways. I really recommend striking up a conversation with any of our speakers, and you'll see that not only can't, you, can't they be categorized, but they're more like amalgamations of several people put together in terms of their achievements and the breadth of work that they've done. Uh, next slide, please. Shabir. Uh, as you know, this conference will be running for three days. Today, we'll be starting off with a speech from our keynote speaker, Anita Marwaha Madil, who we'll be proud to introduce in a few seconds. Following that, we'll be hosting a panel theme, <coughs> a panel, excuse me, titled A 360 View of the Canadian Space Industry, which will aim to take a holistic look at the trends we see in the Canadian space sector and try to predict the opportunities and changes that we should be seeing in the next couple of years, next couple of decades, and so forth. Before we get into any of that, though, I'd just like to thank the team. So, uh, this, is, this has been a hectic year working with all of you, but I couldn't have asked for a better team of resourceful and intelligent people. So I'm very thankful for all of you guys for helping uh, 
not just helping, but making this event happen. Uh, I'd also like to thank our sponsors. So I'll start off with our silver sponsors, GHGSAT and Supercluster. And then I want to go to talk about our gold sponsor, the University of Toronto Institute of Aerospace Studies. Um, if it weren't for if it weren't for these kind of organizations, uh, these kind of events that we run, which make space accessible to Canadians, wouldn't be possible. And so we'd really like to thank our sponsors from the bottom of our heart. On that final note, I'd like to pass the mic back to Shamira. Thanks, Arsalan. So as you may have already familiarized yourself with or explored around the Hopin platform, this is just a quick walkthrough um, if you have not yet touched on the left sections and the buttons on, the, on that left-hand side of your panel. Um, so essentially, um, if you can see from my screen, it's loading very slowly. Um, but this is just a simple walkthrough of Hopin showing you kind of like a quick scroll of the different parts of the platform. But for now, technical difficulties <laughs> is happening, so I'm not sure if it's going to play, but um, it's essentially just a screen recording showing you that Hopin has many, many capabilities. So we have on the left hand side of your screen, even if you just look now, you can see five options. So you have landed probably on the reception. And then you will also be guided to the stage where our keynote is currently happening. Um, and the sessions is where mostly our panel talks and also our speaker talks will be happening tomorrow and today and the next day. Um, and if you may have explored the networking as well, uh, this is a one-on-one -on -one kind of um, setup. And so my video is now deciding to play. Um, but essentially, it, it's just a simple walkthrough. And so the my favorite part probably of this platform is the expo booth um, area. So that's the last button on the left-hand side of the panel. And uh, the expo booth essentially has a lot of industry and institutional representatives that are there, either supervised on a booth or unsupervised on a booth, meaning that there's not someone there that's moderating. So feel free to go there during our coffee hour or coffee, uh, sorry, coffee, uh, 15 minute coffee break. And also during our provided and designated expo session tomorrow from three o'clock to 5 p.m. Um, Eastern time. So now that my video has decided to play, I'll just quickly move on to the expo booth, which you probably may have already explored. Um, but please feel free to visit these. We have a lot of representatives from each of these in institutions um, currently live right now, and even in the 15 minute coffee break happening next, uh, that would be really great and enjoy. Uh, but without further ado, I'd really love to introduce our opening keynote, um, Vanita, We'll be kickstarting our conference. And just to introduce Vanita, she is the founder of Rocket Woman and the, a project manager and business development lead in Mission Control Space Services. Um, she's also um, focused on lunar exploration missions and leading space health initiatives in mission control. So previously, Vanita has been based at the European Space Agency as a contractor, uh, focused on human spaceflight operations for future projects, including the European robotic arm to be launched in the ISS, or the International Space Station. Vanita has worked at the German Aerospace Center, uh, DLR, and ESA on international uh, uh, space station operations and spacesuit design. So at ESA, um, the European Astronaut Center, uh, Vanita also helped design the skin suit and conducted a study on future spacesuit design for lunar exploration. Um, at the German Aerospace Center, she guided astronauts through experiments and wrote astronaut procedures in Germany's version of mission control. Vanita studied mathematics and physics and astrophysics at King's College London and went on to gain master's degree, degrees in space management from the International Space University, or ISU, and in astronautics and space engineering from Cranfield University in the UK. Vanita is an advocate for STEM outreach, founding the platform of Rocket Women, uh, that aims to inspire women to study STEM and consider a career in the space industry. Uh, Rocket Woman has been featured in many me um, media coverage, um, including BBC, Stylist Magazine, She the People, Fast Company, and The Telegraph. Uh, based in Canada, Vanita led an intelligent transportation systems team as an engineering manager and took part in the focused roundtable discussion with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, highlighting the importance of education. She was mentioned in Elle magazine's feature on 12 genius young women shaping the future. 
And so without further ado, I see Benita now on our stage. So we're really lucky to have you here, Benita, and I'll give you the floor. Welcome. Thank you so much, Shamira. Um, I have some slides as well. Uh, is there a way to share them possibly? Great. Okay. Bear with me. Perfect. Okay. Hopefully that should be loading up now. Okay, great. I see it. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, my name is Vanita, as Shamira mentioned, and uh, my background is in operations for human spaceflight and robotics mainly. Uh, I'm the founder of Rocket Women, which is uh, a organization which aims to inspire the next generation of young women to choose a career in STEM and also a project manager at Mission Control in Ottawa, working on lunar exploration projects. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to speak to all of you this evening, and I'm really excited to be here and talk to you about my career path in space, and hopefully I can provide you with uh, some useful advice along the way uh, and also some inspiration. Okay. So I wonder if any of you know uh, who this is. So this is Helen Sharman, and she is the first British astronaut. Now, I want you to come with me to a library in 1993. And in that library, a six-year-old girl is uh, sitting and reading in the children's section, and she loves everything to do about space. So she's found every book that she could about space, and um, is, is dreamt of being uh, an astronaut and um, has, has really been passionate about them she's, since, she was, since she, was, she was young. So she's been meticulously found every single book that she can in the children's library and amongst the stories that she's reading about space shuttle missions and NASA astronauts and in the corner of one of the pages she spots an image of a young woman with brown hair like her um, in a spacesuit with a British flag on the arm and the caption next to the image said that this is Helen Sharman and she's the first British astronaut. And she actually flew to the Mir space station around two years before then. And in that moment, looking at that image, I think this little girl realized um, that her dreams are possible and she knows what she wants to be. She wants to be an astronaut like Helen Sharman. And that six year old girl was me. And I remember being that little girl sitting in the library and learning that the first British astronaut, a chemist, Helen Sharman, flew to the Mir space station. And she was, although I didn't really know it yet, a role model to me. And she showed me that at a young age that my dreams are possible. So I knew I wanted to be an astronaut, but what I didn't know was how. And so what I did is I, uh, it was a bit geeky, but a few years later, I, uh, when I was about 11, I printed out the NASA astronaut guidelines and I stuck these to the inside cover of my secondary school folder. So I was in the UK, so my high school folder. Um, and they were really a daily reminder of how to achieve my goals. And I set my focus on achieving them. And those guidelines said that I had to have a, uh, an astronaut candidate needs to have a bachelor's degree in engineering, physical science, mathematics, or biology. Um, so I studied maths and physics with astrophysics at King's College London in the UK. Um, we actually started up off with a, a mixed course of uh, boys and girls. And in the end, um, the, on that particular course, only three girls graduated with uh, the rest of our uh, rest of the students deciding to do uh, maths and management and a few other courses as well. But because um, the three of us really stuck together, we're really, uh, really close to this day. And I think it really helped to have that support network as we went through this course. Um, which required a lot of dedication as well. And uh, it wasn't easy, but I think it's definitely worth it in the end. Um, and one of, the, of those girls went on to be an astrophysicist um, and one is a science teacher. She's a, a physics teacher in the UK and I work in the space industry. Um, and whilst I was at King's in the UK, I heard of a fantastic organization called UK SEDS, similar to SEDS Canada um, here nationally. And it was really at a UK SEDS conference in Milton Keynes in the UK where I met space operation engineers for the first time and really understood a little bit more about the space industry and really the breadth of um, opportunities that were available in space, including somebody that I would actually end up working with five years later in Germany. So being part of SEDS for me really allowed me to interact with professionals and space industry, space agencies and also space companies as well. So. I think at that point, rather than space being just a dream for me, I think it um, really felt attainable and not something that I just read about, but something that I could actually be in and participate in. Um, so I've taken small steps over the last decade or so and through high school, secondary school before then to be able to work in the space industry. 
Um, one of the largest was going to the International Space University, um, which was a life-changing experience. And I had daily lectures by astronauts and space industry experts. Um, and I'd highly recommend it to anybody that's uh, looking to further their career and actually um, wants to learn a bit more about the space industry. And uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunities that have come from that as well that I'll talk about. Um, so this is a nine week interdisciplinary program that's both international and intercultural. And you meet people from all around the world and take part in activities, um, including this rocket competition that you can see on the screen. Um, and this is uh, my team of a, a Canadian, an Italian, a Brazilian and myself from the UK. Um, and we designed and built a, a rocket to, and a parachute as well to launch an, an egg into the sky and safely landed back again and we actually won the competition that year which is really exciting um, but it was actually at IOC during the space studies program that I attended a workshop on spacesuit design that was led by a NASA engineer and it was through this that I learned that I wanted to focus on spacesuit design and operations in the future and work in NASA's mission control eventually so after going to ISU, um, I decided to go to study engineering because I had a physics and math background. Um, so I went to Cranfield University in the UK and studied astronautics and space engineering, which was an in-depth master's. Um, and still remembering the astronaut guidelines, I decided to do another master's degree at ISU in space management this time at their main campus in Strasbourg. And this really gave me the complementary skills to a technical background and helped me to understand really why decisions are made in the space industry. So along with project management skills, and business development, economics, um, product management, and strategic planning. So all the skills that I really use on a day-to-day -day basis today, um, those are really the foundation for that. And as I was kind of going along my career path, I also had an amazing opportunity to live and work at NASA Ames Research Center in California for four months, where I taught physics uh, to the students of the ISC Space Studies course in 2009 that year. And that was incredibly rewarding. And really being at NASA Ames was an amazing experience. Um, and I was able to see real life mission development um, and meet the scientists that are working on these missions. Uh, and also learn about lots of really, really interesting R&D, including uh, the vertical uh, motion simulator, for example. But one of the most inspirational people that I met at, um, at NASA Ames and around NASA Ames in the area was uh, the real life Ellie Arroway from the film Contact. And she's a lady on who Judy Foster's character is based, um, if you've seen the movie. And her name is Jill Tarter and uh, she works at SETI. And Jill led the project to build the Allen uh, Telescope Array, which is a massive new instrument that will eventually comprise a 350 antenna and each of six meters in diameter. And she um, has extreme passion for her subject and she's impressively dedicated over 35 years of her life uh, to the search for extraterrestrials as well, which is really impressive. So now considering the astronaut guidelines, still I had a bachelor's degree in maths and physics and I was working on two master's degrees at the same time as well. Um, but to be an astronaut, I still needed more experience. So through the International Space University, I traveled to Russia. And at the time, I didn't know that that trip and, and the project I was, um, I was there for would eventually um, mean that uh, and, and be related to the project that I work on at the European Space Agency a few years later. Um, and that was uh, at ESA, I directly worked with the, with the Russian colleagues, so with Energia and uh, Roscosmos, and also the Astronaut Training Center in Star City, as you can see here on a regular basis, um, specifically working on EVA or spaceport training as well. And I'll talk a bit about, more about that in a couple of slides. So since that initial spark at the uh, ISU to work on spacesuit design and also on spaceport training and operations, I tried to hunt for a spacesuit project to work on. And um, I looked in the US for a while, but I'm from the UK. So um, I found one at the European Space Agency and this is the skin suit project. And moreover, I persuaded them to let me work on it during an internship. Um, and I actually was uh, able to get that internship through the International Space University. Um, so I initially joined as a trainee for my ISU master's internship before eventually becoming a consultant on the project. Um, and also I worked on EVA suit design as well whilst at ESC and also on operations for lunar exploration as well, which is very relevant to, to what we're working on today as well. Um, so coming back to the, to the skin suit, as many of you uh, likely know, the ast astronauts lose around two to three percent of their bone mass during six month missions on the ISS. And they also grow around four to six centimeters uh, taller as well in height. And that 
impacts their spinal health. And that can also be quite painful for them. Um, for example, NASA astronaut Anne McLean grew around five centimeters uh, in three months uh, during her mission on the space station. Um, so the skin suit is designed to be worn inside the spacecraft and provides loading onto the astronaut's body that essentially recreates the effect of gravity on their skeleton. So each skin suit is individually fitted to the astronaut. Um, and you can see Tom Pesquet here from uh, an ESA astronaut wearing it on board the space station. And a tailor takes 150 measurements of the body before the astronaut flies, along with the mass and height to customize the suit. Um, so it, it was initially worn on board the space station by Danish European astronaut Andreas Morgensen, and most recently, as you can see here, by French East astronaut Thomas Pesquet uh, during, during a six month mission as well. So it's amazing to have worked on the initial prototypes of the suit um, and having seen it being used on the space station uh, and actually being used to help astronauts is really the ultimate reward. Um, and you can see an example of the prototype on the left there, and that's uh, EAC with my mum actually that came to visit that day. So from working on spacesuits, I moved to space station operations at the German Aerospace Center, or DLR. Um, so my typical day there involved supporting astronauts on board the space station to carry out experiments. Um, I also trained astronauts on payload experiments, developed new experiment payloads with the scientists or the PIs, um, and also communicated with NASA and ESA colleagues for different payloads on a regular basis as well. Um, but one of the things I really enjoyed there was writing the crew or astronaut procedures as well that the crew would then be trained on and also use on orbit. Um, and I think the most important skills for an ISS operations engineer are communication. So both on console and also with your international colleagues uh, based around the world. And more specifically, the ability to think quickly to provide an accurate response in case of an anom anomaly as well on the ISS and also to really be prepared. So after spending some time working in Waterloo in Canada for, uh, for a few years for a tech company, I went back to Europe um, and worked at the European Space Agency again, but this time as a contractor at their technology center and that's Aztec in the Netherlands. Um, and what on, uh, at Aztec, I focused on uh, future human spaceflight projects and operations mainly, um, including for the European robotic arm or ERA. Um, and ERA is a new robotic arm that's being launched to the space station this year, which is really exciting. And um, it's going to help astronauts and cosmonauts carry out spacewalks on board the space, on board the space station and also help to install new parts of the space station, mainly to the Russian segment. Um, and here you can see an image on the right of uh, ESA astronaut Samantha Cristoretti uh, training to use the EVA control interface for ERA. So one of my jobs um, as part of my role at Aztec was to uh, work on the cosmonaut and also the crew instructor training, uh, specifically related to, related to spacewalks as well. So uh, that was really incredible. And I think we made a lot of really interesting innovations there as well uh, relation to that. Um, and now I'm based at Mission Control in Ottawa, and we're a space exploration and robotics company with a focus on mission operations, onboard autonomy and AI. And we're developing innovative and solutions uh, using space technology to solve the world's problems and also explore space through developing software solutions designed for space activities from lunar exploration um, all the way through to astronaut support systems as well uh, that we're looking at. Um, so currently, one of the projects that we're working on is a novel science enhancing AI technology payload. Um, and this project called ASAS Creators is supported by the Canadian Space Agency, and it consists of cutting edge AI algorithms to classify the terrain of the lunar surface, which essentially makes lunar rovers smarter scientists, and it reduces the operational workload as well of scientists on the ground. Um, and the science autonomy system characterizes geological features from camera images taken by lunar rovers. And even in the future, it could potentially be used during an astronaut spacewalk as well as they explore the lunar surface to so detect and uh, select features of scientific interest uh, to sample. So uh, lots to look forward to. And another really exciting project that um, I'm leading as well at Mission Control uh, is Mission Control Intelligence. And um, we're conducting this project in partnership with Axiom Research Labs in India to demonstrate AI powered levels of autonomy on a micro rover ahead of commercial missions to the moon. And MCI is, is um, really a suite of cutting edge technologies that will enable mission opera operators to make key decisions in science and navigation objectives um, and operations faster and give them more confidence as they do so. And it's designed to meet the growing need for AI powered robotic missions in the future. 
Um, and I think a really exciting thing to point out about this is we will be conducting a series of tests in our new high fidelity lunar analog terrain at Mission Control's headquarters in Ottawa this summer to test how the MCI suite can benefit science operations with AOL's Eco Rover. So um, stay tuned about that. And we've got lots to announce and I'm really excited about uh, the, upcoming, the upcoming activities. Um, and the software applications and novel autonomy capabilities that were developed through this project are really going to be independent from the rover platform so uh, we can integrate these technologies later on into future missions um, maybe including a potential canadian micro rover mission like i mentioned um, and we also have a really exciting public outreach pro program called machine control academy that i also are able to contribute to and this allows any class of students with an internet connection the opportunity to learn about planetary science rover design and ultimately plan and execute an exploration mission remotely and also tell or operate a real rover prototype in an analog lunar environment. Um, and uh, we're also we're going to use our lunar terrain for this program. Um, and this allows students to be involved in an, an experience rover and mission operations, which is really fantastic, I think, when you're at high school, especially. Um, and a few members of the mission control team will be available at our booth during certain coffee breaks throughout the conference. So please feel free to connect if you have any questions about any of this. So coming back to my career path, as I was going along my career journey, I noticed that over the years, as I progressed to each step, so from high school all the way through to uh, working in the space industry, the number of women that progressed with me to ultimately choose a career in engineering especially decreased. And that's something that's called the leaky pipeline syndrome as well. And if you, in fact, if you look at the numbers in Canada, just around 23% of science and technology workers are women um, among Canadians aged 25 to 64. And uh, women currently make up around 20% of students studying engineering in Canada specifically. Um, and if we look at the UK comparatively, only 12% of, of the engineering workforce is female. And according to recent research by the Royal Academy of Engineering, around 9% of engineering professionals are from black, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds compared to 12% of the UK population. So my passion and the goal of Rocket Women and our team is to work to reverse this trend um, by empowering young women globally to consider a career in STEM and support them throughout this. We really believe that seeing someone that looks like you both shows you and allows you to believe that it's possible to achieve your goal. But why is this important? Well, it's really important to inspire the next generation because looking to the future, there's a massive skill requirement for engineering upcoming over the next few years globally. And we really need to reverse that trend that I mentioned. Um, and at Rocket Women, we believe that the lack of gender and racial diversity in STEM is, including the space sector really, is not only an issue of inequality, but also affects the engineering that we do and the systems that we create. So we really need to enable engineering as a profession to reflect more of society, to prevent unconscious biases from being incorporated into design and also applications. So everything from developing new spacesuits to exploring the surface of the moon to AI and noble facial recognition algorithms as well. We need to ensure that the creators and developers of these systems represent the range of backgrounds, cultures, and experiences that, that um, of diverse users to prevent these biases from being incorporated as well. So I think this is more important, I think now than ever, when we kind of need 100% of the talent available as well to solve the really hard problems that we have in the world today. So um, uh, as, uh, as mentioned in the introduction, Rocket Women and myself are really fortunate to work on this goal through being involved in campaigns um, and a, a campaign included uh, one that we did, um, I did a few years ago with uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's office and Instagram, which is really exciting. And um, so um, that's a bit about my background, but how do you create your path in space? So firstly, I think some really good advice is you can't be what you can't see. So during my career, I've met some amazing people, especially other positive uh, female role models. And I really think you need those role models out there, tangible and visible, to be able to inspire the next generation to become astronauts or be whatever they want to be. And I realized that the achievements of these incredible women wasn't being shared. And one of the reasons that I started Rocket Women was to provide a platform to share their advice and ensure that the voices were being heard. And um, there's a really great quote by Sally Ride, the first American woman in space, sums up the importance of this. And I quote, I never went into physics or the astronaut corps to become a role model. But after my first flight, it became clear to me that I was one. And I began to understand the importance of that to people. Young women, young girls need to see role models in whatever careers they may choose. 
just so they can picture themselves during those jobs someday. You can't be what you can't see. And this is one of my favorite quotes, and it's absolutely true. So when you're younger, you need to be able to see yourself carrying out a role in science, technology, engineering, and maths in the future, if that's what you choose to do. And I think role models are not only important as you, as you start your career, but also throughout your career as well. So from everything, um, whether you decide to apply for that job that you have most of the qualifications for, maybe not all, I'd say you should always apply. Um, or even seeing someone that reflects you in a leadership position as well in your industry or company can make a really big difference to your career. Um, and I think uh, they're really essential to provide you with those examples that look up to you when you're making those critical decisions, both in your education and your career. Um, so one of the things that we're aiming to do through Rocket Omen as well is to change a stereotype. And a great example of this actually um, is the Royal Academy of Engineering. This is an engineering campaign in the UK that I'm really thrilled to be involved with. And the campaign celebrates the engineers shaping our lives and the world around us to challenge these narrow public stereotypes of engineering and aim to encourage more young people from all backgrounds to consider engineering as a profession. Um, and I think a lot of us today understand um, that engineering really is everywhere, but we're trying to make that clear to the public as well. And then to make sure that everyone understands that it's really at the heart of everything you do. So engineering is, is involved in everything from your mobile phone to satellites to special effects and your favorite sci-fi show. But there's actually a narrow and outdated stereotype of engineers um, and what engineers do uh, um, that's in the public perception. And we need to change uh, this perception and we need to change the way that the public thinks of the engineers look like and also the role they play in society. Um, and this can sometimes uh, prevent young people from considering these really rewarding and varied careers in the future. Um, and I think one of the uh, one thing that I really encourage you all to do is to go out and communicate uh, the work that you do. And I think the space industry is really diverse and it's becoming more and more every day. Um, I think we've got a long way to go, but I think one way that we can do that is to really go out and work together and help change really the stereotype of engineering and uh, the work that we do and show the public exactly what that is and what we all look like. Um, so what uh, what other bar barriers uh, are there to a career in space? So. I think there also seems to be a disconnect between young women in particular wanting to make a difference and also knowing the impact that a career in uh, STEM can make. And I think there are also cultural barriers that we need to overcome. So my background is a British Asian. So my parents, are, my mum is from India. Um, so although my parents are really supportive of my interest in space and science, there was some pressure to study a traditional subject for a girl. So become a dentist or a doctor or a pharmacist or a teacher, which are all great professions, but I knew that that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and I think sometimes in those cultures, they can be considered a safe choice or an acceptable job for a girl in the South Asian culture in particular. So I actually worked as a dental nurse on the weekends and all studying at sixth form. Um, and it helped my parents and I both realize that although I enjoyed some aspects of, of the job, it wasn't, um, being a dentist really wasn't for me in the future. But it did actually help down the line. And I think having that medical background helped when I um, had to work on some medical aspects at the European Space Agency as a con contractor to develop the launch campaign for the European Robotic Arm, um, where the team goes to the launch site in Kazakhstan to prepare the arm for launch. Um, and also uh, having uh, had the ability to work at the space medicine office as well on the skin suit. Um, I think so it's helped I think it's helped overall in the long run but ultimately we do need to address the lack of representation of black asian and minority ethnic women in stem in particular and in the space industry and also I think ensure that the stories are visible and also able to inspire and support both the future career decisions that young women make and also provide their parents and peers with examples of successful careers as well so one of the things that we're doing through Rocket Women is to make sure that these stories of diverse women in STEM globally are really visible. Um, another thing I wanted to say is I think you have to remember as well that you don't have to be the best in, in your subject. You don't have to be the best in your engineering class or your science class. You just have to, to work in the space. I think you, you don't have to be number one or number two. And I definitely wasn't either of those things. Um, and as Dave and Newman said, she said, you don't have to um, it, you don't have to be the best, you have to want to help humankind and that should be the passion. So um, I think just be proficient, as she said, and we need to really change the conversation to ensure that you know that you're all in as well, that you don't have to be a genius or the best to work in space. I think everybody is included. 
Um, and relatedly, um, she also said that you can zig and zag and you don't need it all figured out as well. So, um, but what if you don't want to work, what if you don't want to study science, but you still want to work in the space industry? I think there are lots of opportunities to do that and different pathways that you can choose to work in the space industry. So during a Rocket Woman interview um, with Emma Leinhardt from NASA, she rightly mentioned that although we need more female STEM graduates, we also need, in her words, more policy wonks. We need accountants, we need lawyers, we need artists, we need English majors, and we need people to really effectively communicate the work that we do to the public. So that's really important. Um, and Emma in the interview described that she was really struck by um, somebody who had a really big impact on her when she was an intern at NASA originally. And um, she'd only ever had one meeting with her, but she was absolutely struck that a French literature scholar became a deputy associate administrator for space operations, and that was Lynn Klein. Um, so I think uh, if you, if you work if you want to work in space, there are lots of different pathways to do so. So um, STEM isn't the only way, but I think we also need to know that you can kind of move around throughout your career. It's not linear, so you can work in science communication. You can come back to engineering and vice versa. I think it's really good to have that breadth of skill set as well and have different different passions that you enjoy. So the other thing I wanted to mention is know you belong. So women have been a really crucial part of humanity's race to explore. And recently, the story of these amazing women, including the late mathematical genius Catherine Johnson, as you can see on the screen, has been commemorated in a movie titled Hidden Figures. And Catherine played a role in every major US space program from um, calculating the trajectory for Alan Shepard's inaugural flight to, this, uh, to really uh, going through to the space shuttle era as well. And, she even calculated the 1969 Apollo 11 flight to the moon um, and uh, also Apollo 13's return, um, return back to Earth. So when the Apollo 13 mission was aborted, she helped to safely return the crew through her work on backup procedures and charts as well. Um, and in the words of former NASA Deputy Administrator David Newman, who I have heavily quoted throughout the talk, um, Catherine literally wrote the textbook on rocket science. And we're also fortunate that Catherine insisted on asking questions and on relentlessly pursuing the answers. We are fortunate that when faced with the adversity of racial and gender barriers, she found the courage to tell, say, tell them I'm coming. But Catherine Johnson initially wasn't made to feel welcome in the room, but she knew that she belonged there. So I would recommend that you channel your inner Catherine Johnson and really find that power and know that you belong in the room to get this work done and that they need you. And another really uh, good similar example is um, by Ellen Stofan, and she's a director of the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, DC, and the former NASA chief scientist. And she said that sometimes I felt that I was part of the team until somebody said something that made me realize I was a woman. As I got more confident, I realized that they really needed me in this room. So that's something to really remember. Um, another piece of advice that I wanted to mention is get to the starting line. So after launching to space on both NASA Space Shuttle and also then on uh, the Russian Soyuz vehicle, astronaut Sunita Williams will be, um, she's going to be the, one of the first female NASA astronauts to fly to the International Space Station on board the new US commercial vehicles being developed. Um, and Sunita actually formerly held the, uh, the record for the longest spacewalk time by a female astronaut. She completed the triathlon in space and she's also the second female commander of the International Space Station. So those are really impressive things. Um, but some, some advice that she gave was, it's good to understand how things work. And she believes that being an engineer helped her to become a helicopter pilot and then eventually that led her to NASA. Um, and some advice that she gave is, the path doesn't necessarily have to be straight, but don't limit yourself to what you know. Go out and try new things. You just need to get to the starting line. So in summary, um, you can't be what you can't see. Change your stereotype know that you belong and get to the starting line. But things are changing in the space industry. The 2013 NASA astronaut class was actually 50% female, which is the highest ratio of women selected. And um, that uh, brought the percentage of female NASA astronauts in the astronaut corps to almost 30%. Um, and this is 30 years after Sally Ride became the first American woman in space. So NASA is really looking forward, which is fantastic. And the most recent 2017 astronaut class you can see here has five uh, women out of a total of 12 astronauts selected, with two astronauts actually selected at 29 years old. So if you think about it, that's close to 10 years between completing grade 12 at high school to being selected as an astronaut. 
Um, and Zena Cordman at 29 didn't know if she had enough experience to be an astronaut to, be, to meet the bare minimum NASA astronaut requirements while studying for her doctorate. But she applied anyway and became a national out of over 18,000 applicants made. She said, I've got nothing to lose and this will be really a, this will be a really cool experience no matter what. So Zena really prioritized her passion and she persevered. And so the last example that I wanted to mention is um, about Anima Patel Sabale. So Anima grew up in India and she wants to be an astronaut, but she faced criticism when she would tell people that she wanted to do that. And her inspiration was India's only astronaut at the time, Rakesh Sharma. So growing up, she thought she'd become a fighter pilot like him and then become an astronaut. And um, even though India wasn't accepting female fighter pilots yet, um, but she was hopeful that things would change by the time that she graduated. So to be a fighter pilot, she had to study engineering or physics. But she grew up in a, a traditional household and her dad said that she needed to study um, near home. Um, so she applied, she studied physics and applied to be a fighter pilot. And even though it said that only males could apply in India, um, but she was refused. But the criteria they provided was that she was short sighted and they needed 2020 vision. So on the back of that, she went to fight for an education as well as her father said that she shouldn't do a three year program as there were marriage proposals coming in for her and he couldn't guarantee if she could complete her degree if they found a boy suitable for her and decided to get her married. But she persevered and her mum supported her by telling her dad that she was smart and ambitious to let her study and that they, should, they could negotiate with her in-laws and her husband to allow her to complete her studies. Well, thanks to her mum, Anima got to complete her degree and having worked to rewrite Indian traditions, um, especially in her household, Anima moved to the US. She completed two master's degrees and now she works at NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston as an Orion spacecraft simulations lab manager, um, as you can see there. And she supports humanity's quest to return to the moon, which is really exciting as well. And she also gets up at 4 a.m. every day to, to reach her goals and to care for her family as well. I think this real dedication prioritizes her passion. Um, but hopefully she also gets some sleep on the weekends. So to be an astronaut or work in the space industry, you have to study something that you love and are passionate about. You have to enjoy what you study and the work that you're doing. And also some good advice to really pay attention to what your passion is for as well. So in summary, you can't be what you can't see. Change a stereotype, know that you belong, get to the starting line and also prioritize your passion and persevere. So I think these are really um, the five tenets that I believe will really help to encourage the next generation and hopefully have been useful to you to make a difference uh, and also um, guide you through a career in space as well. So kind of um, lastly, cycling back to Helen Sharman, I think for me, um, seeing Helen Sharman in a library book at a, young, at a young age, really, she became a role model to me. and knowing that there had been a British female astronaut, I think helped me push through any anxiety or any negativity around my chosen career path when I was younger. So I knew I wanted to be an astronaut, but what I didn't know um, was how to do that, or um, at least I knew I wanted to work in space, a human space flight somehow. And eventually I did do that, but I don't think I would have uh, been able to have had the impetus to do so if I hadn't known that there was somebody that had come before me. So there had been a British female astronaut and maybe there could be again. I think she showed me that it was possible. So through featuring um, advice and stories of uh, women in science and engineering, um, one of the things that we're looking at through doing through, doing through Rocket Women and one of our goals is to give other women and, and, um, and women that same realization that they can have a career in STEM and they can achieve their dreams. And we can also improve the current percentage of female engineering talent available to give every girl the chance to reach their potential and also change the world through STEM as well. So. I'll leave you with this great quote by Kirsty Duncan, um, and uh, she says, dream your greatest dream and know anything is possible. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hi, Vanita. Can you hear me okay? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. I just popped back in. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you so much for that amazing talk. And I can speak for everyone on the chat, I think, um, when I say that that was truly inspirational. And also, we do need to channel our inner Katherine Johnsons and just do it <laughs> and do something that we love. Um, but <laughs> thank you so much for coming and kicking off our conference. I think that was amazing. I, I can't, st I'm, a big fan. So oh, thank I'm gonna you. Go, it's really kind of you. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go ahead and ask some qu questions from the chat. Um, and from the people in the audience tuning in, um, please 
feel free to just drop your questions in the chat um, and we'll go one at a time and kind of try to answer them before uh, Vanita can go. Um, so I think one of the first questions that was here is just to recap, um, Heidi Bathory is asking, what was the name of the scientist working on the antenna array? Um, Jill Tata. Okay. Um, okay. It, okay. Is there any way that I can try to type it on the chat? How do you spell that again? It's uh, J I L L and then Tata. T A R T E R. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> is it too late for 30 year olds? <laughs> Richard Bond is asking. No, it's not too late at all. There's lots of time. <laughs> You can especially, um, I think, um, through ISU, I think one of the great things about ISU is it brings together people from a lots of different generations. So I went uh, I, I went to the International Space Station, uh, International Space University, um, just, I think I hadn't even graduated. I was just about to graduate from my bachelor's. So um, that's when I, I did the space studies program. And, and you can go all the way through to later on in your career. So I think it's amazing to have that. Um, collaboration between, I think, more experienced space professionals and also, I think, younger younger people as well. So I think that's a great place to start. Awesome. And I think we had an earlier question um, that was answered verbally by some of our audience members, but I'd like to just carry it out for you. But um, mm -hmm. uh, Sushitra is asking, uh, my daughter is obsessed about space and and is developing herself each day and every day. Is there any course that she can attend to develop her space knowledge further? She's 10 years old. Um, yeah, definitely. So uh, there is, um, I'm not sure which which country, but I, I know there's lots of online courses as well. Um, the UK has, I think, the UK Space Academy, so they have lots of courses. Um, uh, one of the things that we're involved with is the uh, is teacher training with the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, so I know in the UK, the Royal Academy of Engineering has lots of really exciting uh, space courses and space programs uh, that they also have uh, are doing online as well. But uh, um, I think look at I think the UK Space Academy in the UK are doing lots of online programs that she might be interested in. Okay, and I think. Um, if there's another question, I think there, there's a few more questions, but I think um, if do you, if you have a little bit more time, uh, Benito, we can ask maybe one or two more and then cap it off there. Yeah, sure. I have a couple more minutes. Okay. Um, so we have a question for uh, from Faith. Mm -hmm. Do you have any advice uh, for those who want to work in space industry but do not have a specific sector decided? Um, yes, I think one of the great things about the space industry is that it's so broad so as i mentioned i think you um you can also have experience and try and try out different parts of the space industry as well and a good way to do that and i'm not sure kind of what stage of, of the career that they're at but um you could do a graduate trainee program and so one of the good things about that if you do that at a company is that you get to um get to try different parts of the company as well so you kind of get to learn about the engineering side and get to experience different divisions so that's a good way to kind of um, learn about different parts of one company um and i think as i mentioned as well the iac was really uh, really broad and really interdisciplinary so it's a good way to learn about different parts of uh, the space industry as well um and i think one of the great things uh, for me just uh, if i can say working at mission control as well is that you get to work on really exciting projects but also learn about different parts of the organization as you go so i think there's lots of uh, ability to kind of reach out and try new things and gain new roles and responsibilities at a company like that yeah of course okay amazing um and i think to end off, um, I wanted to ask this question. I think this may apply for everyone too, um, from Daviani. Um, sh they're asking, were there any interesting er extracurricular activities you were working on during your undergraduate um, that helped you with your career in space? Um, I, I affiliated the uh, the university's physics um, organization with UK SEDS, which is a great idea to do. So I know they have their own chapter now. So I think that really helped. I think that was a big step. So um, I think that was a starting point. And then I ended up, um, I also was on the UK SEDS committee later on. So I think what you're doing now is fantastic by attending conferences like this. Um, uh, so, and also I, um, also volunteered and also um, the talks at schools throughout um, my undergraduate degree as well to kind of gain a bit more of the um, teaching experience. And I think that was also really rewarding and a great way, I think, to learn about a subject is to be able to teach it. And also you kind of see the students being inspired. So I really enjoyed doing that also. 
Okay, awesome. And okay, this is a last question just a few seconds ago. I just squeeze it in. But what would your advice be for international students who want to pursue careers in the space industry? Because just I know that our audience today is mm -hmm. a lot of international students as well. Yeah. Um, so I think there are lots of companies in, in the US and internationally that are that are um, hiring international students and it's possible to get visas. So, um, of course, I think there are some sectors uh, that are ITAR restricted, for example. So um, when I was looking at spacesuits, I think I, I wasn't able to do that in the US. But I think look locally um, as, a, as a starting point, I suppose. And I'm sure there'll be something that you're that, that kind of meets what your interests are um, I think in the country that you're in. And if not, um, look to commercial companies. Companies. I think commercial companies are a great way to um, get experience from an international uh, perspective as well. And I know a lot of them hire international students. And um, if you're looking at NASA, I know that NASA Ames are a great place to go if you uh, want to um, work at NASA as an international student. And uh, I know lots of people that have uh, worked there as international um, and international students uh, to do internships. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, um, Vanita. I think um, if anyone else has any questions, um, I think Vanita will be here for some duration of the conference. So I think there's also a direct messaging um, platform via Hopin. So I think maybe if you'd like to take advantage of that, uh, we're new to this platform. So our apologies also yeah. if we're kind of just familiarizing ourselves. So please feel free to explore. And uh, right now we actually have a coffee break a little bit or just a little stretch break. Um, we're going to be heading on to the sessions uh, section, so not the stage, but the sessions um, in a few minutes uh, to introduce our first panel, which is this 360 view of the Canadian space industry. So once again, thank you so much, Vanita, and thank we'll you. stop broadcasting um, and see you all there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much.